thank you so much for joining me. I'm so, so, so excited that you're here because this is so cool. This is such a good book. Um, like, honestly, you know, we were so excited to see it. I think it was like, it was already featured really early in the year for, by some really prominent magazines. Um, so, you know, I was like really excited. I was like, yes, I need to, I, I just happened to find you of all places at the uh, International Women's Podcast Awards um, session. And then there you were. And I was like, I can't believe it. That's crazy. <laughs> it's lovely to be here, Shashwati. Um, I'm so it was a pleasure to meet you as well. I didn't obviously realise that I was doing crowd work, <laughs> and that's how we met. So I th I would like to tell everybody who's listening how much of a great sport you are because um, you know what it's like when you're on stage and you're just like just doing whatever whatever you can and like it was just nice to see you with your very very handsome boyfriend. Um, <laughs> man fiance just you know human dick um sorry <laughs> <laughs> so no it was lovely to meet you and it's a pleasure to be here you've had some amazing guests so I feel um in a very uh I feel honored no no honestly honor is mine and uh honestly and you know before we start I'm going to do a quick introduction because as you've seen already Sadia has a, quite a wonderful personality and it, there's, a, there's, <laughs> a, there's a very big there's a good reason for all of that so first of all Sadia Asmat is a stand-up comedian and writer from East London. Through a chance encounter with a comedian in a call centre, she was introduced to the circuit and now is a regular stand-up. In 2018, Sadia launched a critically acclaimed BBC podcast, No Country for Young Women, which was named as one of the best audio 2018 by The Observer and Apple's top picks for 2018, which is huge. She currently works as a producer for BBC Studios, Sex Bomb, The Life and Loves of an Asian Babe is her first book. So as you can see, there's a very good reason <laughs> we, we, we've got to this point. So I've got to ask, what made you feel this was the right time to write the book? So I've been doing comedy uh, for a long time and like over, f let's say nearly 10 years, right? And um, it, a lot of Stand up is about finding your voice. And I got to the stage where I was doing loads of jokes on stage um, about the mess that is my love life. And, um, you know, the car crash, I was trying to say, the car crash that is my love life. And it, it's, it's kind of like really well, well received. And I think it's when you're very true to your voice and, and your heart, that's really what resonates. And so um, I kind of just, I, I had a, I was fortunate enough to have a little article in the Metro in 2019. And I it was called the paper gave it a title uh, after I'd written it. Um, Horny women like me aren't supposed to exist during Ramadan. And uh, that was really funny. And uh, it basically went viral. It, I, I was really pleased that it was very successful. Um, Sputnik Russia wow. <laughs> featured the piece. And I was like, oh, Russia? <laughs> now they know as well. So it's like, I'm not just like a loser on UK turf um, sexually. Uh, no, no, I don't mean loser, but I, I'm... I'm not lucky. I'm not only am I unlucky in love in in the national turf, but like globally now, <laughs> um, which is hilarious. And so, I you know I I've always loved writing. It's a huge um, passion of mine, and and I think writing a book takes a long time. And then you know lockdown happened, so we had a lot of time. And I met my editor, um, Katie Packer. Shout out to to the Queen. She she's like um, edited like the receipts book mm -hmm. and Lil Kim's memoirs. So like she's she's been an angel to work with. And so yeah, met her. And then um, yeah, I think it's like timing. It, it was perfect to be honest with you. Uh, why was it the right time? Because I just I just realised that it is my truth mm -hmm. and that. So many other women um, feel the same. Like when I was doing stand up, so many women were, were laughing along and enjoying it. And, and, you know, at parts, they'd be like, we relate to you. And so it just felt so convenient that the narrative we always hear about British Asian women is that we're oppressed or repressed or whatever mm -hmm. stupid word that the haters want to give us. And actually, um, I just really wanted to put sex on the table for conversation. Oh my god! You know, literally segued into my next me like next question because I was just like, exactly. Why do you think these these people have these like weird notions about love and marriage in South Asian relationships? Because it's really strange. It's like I don't know where they've got this concept, especially since like arranged marriage came from Britain. 
<laughs> exactly. And and also when you say came from, it hasn't gone anywhere. <laughs> like, you know, I'm really convinced that Prince Harry and Meghan Markle was an arranged marriage. Well, but Kate and William yeah. for sure. Yeah, exactly. And so look, it's very much steeped in their culture, but I think I think there's so much like messiness when it comes to racism and I, I think it's like about miseducating people um to forget um you know heritage and to forget what's influenced um certain practices and so I mean we had Karma Sutra babe so yeah. like no one's telling me I'm repressed so if if you want to think that I'm repressed that's on you but like you know don't don't please please we taught you 69 we taught you the clock um whatever that position is the clock one. <laughs> not the that I can clock. do it yeah <laughs> I'm saying but like you know we we've come up with a lot that they just conveniently want to either kind of due to hatred bury or um kind of remanufacture their own narratives that suits them I don't know what it is it could be jealousy intimidation fear hatred all of the above not all of them though that's the thing and so you know I just I just have to be honest like so much of comedy and 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 what I like to do is is comes from from a real and honest place and so um I just hope that it's embraced by everybody else but like um it's not to say that you know that parts of people from every culture have like some strangeness don't they so it's like you don't need to be labeled as that because you have to kind of let someone behave um, and present themselves on on face value before you kind of make those assertions and so I've never really felt ashamed when it came to sex um I'm a comedian I'm able to laugh and make jokes out of certain things but you know I just wanted to to put something on the on the table that was original and that felt like me and that you know spoke truth to women and and you know our experience um but yeah like you know what happens when you don't have the arranged marriage and you're brown like that's that's the book it's kind of like if you don't yeah if you don't feel like you fit on the dating scene but you're also you know not very um sought after on the arranged marriage scene and then like no one's there to help you along the way you you got to figure out a lot by yourself and and some of that means you might um end up having some hard knocks along the way right Oh, God, yeah, completely. When I was reading it, I was like, yep, yep, I pretty much don't fit into any of this either because, you know, I was like a guitarist tattooed, all that. And, you know, and I was into, like, rock music, like heavy metal, extreme metal music. Of course, no no (laughs) Asian guy's going to go for that. They were like, what the hell are you? And most of the time I was called a coconut as a result. Um, So you you know that feeling, yeah. Yeah. Do you get fetishized? Sorry, let me say it properly. Do you get fetishized? Oh, God, badly. Yeah. So that's the problem is that we're either, how are you either going to be like a nun or like a sex, you know, model? It's like, but most people are somewhere in, in between. Like you have your side where you're kind of like, you know, professional, or whatever, or corporate, whatever it is. And then you have your like sexy side. But it's, it's, it's something that belongs to you. It's not for. Uh, you know other people's um, I don't know spectatorship it's like it's how you want to kind of use it really and so again it was something that I felt as a as a female as a as a Muslim as a as a woman I've said woman already but like as as me basically it was something that nobody tells you that you're going to have sexuality or what it means Um, and that's like you know, it's setting you up on the back foot because you have so much worth and, and including but also excluding your sexuality is not everything. Um, a lot of men approach us with that fetishization as though we're sex objects mm-hmm. and it will be like, oh, you know, I, I really want to, why couldn't I sleep with a girl like you? And it gets, it gets either too hot and heavy so quick, like literally in a DM, or you're getting none of that and they're yeah. acting like they shouldn't disrespect you with eye contact. So... <laughs> exactly this and it's the bizarre thing isn't it there's there's two sides of this there's one is that weird binary of the virgin and the whore and <laughs> it, it's so strange and and the other aspect is the strange kind of like fascination with women's virginities like honestly mm-hmm. like why do you think we have these bizarre concepts yeah I, I mean I agree with you and I feel like I feel like 
you know, it's a great question and I wish I had all the answers. One of them is 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 that we need to be able to have conversations about it. And it's like, um, yeah, just demystifying some of it. I feel like, I think, why do we have these issues? I think it's just where certain people, and, I, and I'm not trying to say that we're oppressed, anybody listening, <laughs> please. It's just like, okay, so I think that some of our family as well didn't have um, kind of like the conversations that we're having today. Mm -hmm. And so if they were taught to be very prudish or to be very conservative, that obviously feeds trickles down into the way that we're raised. Um, I, I just feel like it's a fine balance between micromanaging your kids and then like doing nothing. Um, So you need to kind of, know what your kids you know have conversations with them talk to them uh you know but don't smother them Mm -hmm. those types of things will be really really important so I think that's probably why I feel like on that side of things I I have quite a healthy attitude because I wasn't told you can't do this or you you shouldn't do this like I mean I was told it but I didn't mean it if that makes sense like I wasn't scared of the repercussions and so if, if people have had a little bit more of a stricter upbringing, then that can lead them to kind of maybe not explore their sexuality or sexual identities um, in, a, in a kind of a time of their life when they would have. And then kind of then if you're visiting it later, um, maybe you get that FOMO, you're trying to make up for lost time. Uh, you know, like Mariah Carey, where initially, like her, this is a funny example, but like, you know, initially her um, persona was like just a, a, a singer. And then mm. I felt like, obviously, due to some of the difficulties with Tommy Matola or whatever, whoever her record company, then she kind of like became this like sex kitten, yeah. right? And so I guess, I guess like judgment is like a really, um, key key thing where I'm I try not to judge people I know that it's not always easy but it's like you just never know um what someone is doing or where they're coming from where they are on their journey and so again like I think if there was a little bit less judgment about she's wearing lipstick Hmm. what does that mean she's trying to suck a dick so yeah I think um trying to be less judgment and more open to understanding and conversations would, would, would change things a lot. Yeah, definitely. I think you're completely right about that. You know, this, the, especially the Mariah Carey um, example. You know, yeah. My partner's like the biggest Mariah fan. So he gives me the whole lowdown, the whole background of her, her life story. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so having seen that, I can see that how she kind of switched into like a different persona and it was very much judged uh, as a result. And uh, in a way, we kind of live that ourselves, isn't it? Uh, Especially as like British Asians. And so I was wondering, like, how did the cultural paradox of like being too Asian or like too British affect like experiences, your experiences and and your love life as well? Um, I think we're gonna to have to do before and after terrorism because, wow. <laughs> because yeah that changed a lot so pre pre all of that it was very much like white people trying to be really like um okay with my brownness or very sensitive about like understanding and not saying the right the wrong thing so like sorry not saying the wrong thing they would be like um oh, you know, when are you going to get an arranged marriage? Or I really like the colour of your headscarf and like really surface conversations. Mm. And then after terrorism, you know, I was hoping things would get better, but it actually got worse because Mm. they didn't even know how to look at me. Um, There was a lot of fear. And again, like, you know, I think without having the empowerment to have the conversations, because there was ill feeling on both sides. I say ill feeling, um, but I didn't know what else to say. But like on our side, we're frustrated because we're like, we're not behind this. We're not doing this. And this is like giving us joy or, you know, we don't want to see what's going on. But on their side, they're probably like, um, (laughs) you come into the country, you know, trying to kill people. Like what you do. (laughs) So it's kind of, um, yeah, it was just a tense time. And um could you remind me your question? I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, just just the the weird kind of paradox between being too oh, Asian yes. and too British, isn't it? And to be honest with you, um, I think the message I give junior Muslims or, or the, <laughs> you know uh, the next generation of Asian females 
it wants to be a positive one so I don't always want to be talking about struggle um I would say that it you know you have to focus on a positive so for instance in stand-up being a hijabi Muslim has has actually helped me because mm. because I think women tend to get a little bit more of a tougher time but because of my scarf like I was more accepted on stage mm. which I would expected but I guess people were curious about what someone like me was going to say so it's helped on that perspective but um I think I think you have to find love and you have to find um acceptance where you can it starts with you but like I found my friend Monty um through work Mm -hmm. and through like we did a podcast together and um I think sometimes yeah sometimes you'll find like again with stand up for instance like the kindness of strangers again is like a really like powerful um source of of good energy and inspiration as well right so mm-hmm. i think it hasn't always been easy when you don't see uh, enough diverse stories being represented where you feel like okay none of, nothing that we're seeing or absorbing or taking mm-hmm. in is reflecting us or um is something that you know is is kind of helping elevate us even but saying that so much is changing and even your podcast and like I guess you could say my book um the works that we're doing I really really feel like it's it's improving um the paradox because we're we're taking the narrative back and we're speaking for ourselves. and so where there have been those gaps in terms of uh realistic portrayals of asian experience at south asian experience it's kind of like leveling out in that there are more there's definitely more representation mm. and um people are just like i think I think we've become more sophisticated as consumers and we're not going to accept uh, things that patronise or denigrate us anymore. And so it, there's definitely a shift taking place. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I'm like, I've seen so much more like content, just even from a book perspective. I was just like, wow, there's just so much more content from our different kind of diasporas. I was like, finally, it was so good to see like different stories and not just like, all the ones related to marriage and things like that, even though the film industry has a long way to go um, with Definitely, with yeah. uh, Asian representation. And, you know, but it's weird because I spoke to Nikka Shukla earlier this year, who's the uh, editor of uh, The Good Immigrant, and his response mm. was like he was kind of fed up of being like a constantly having to talk about it which was really interesting because I was like how does it feel to be forced to be like a gatekeeper for all things related to like identity or you know British Muslim identity British Muslim yeah exactly yeah um look I, I, I feel very blessed because of the fact that with comedy you can really say something um and you can use humor because some of the things I say, I guess, is not comfortable. It's a bit irreverent, whatever you want to describe it. But when you're coming at it from a from a silly or funny perspective, it's um it's not as tense uh, or dramatic, if you like. And you know, it can really like ease off tensions, if, if anything. And so, um, I like, yeah, I think humor is really, really like key to kind of help having those conversations and like making things. I don't know making us not take ourselves so seriously as well Mm. because yes we have a racial element to it but also we're all human beings and there are universal experiences and I think that's so important to be able to tap into um and that's what I was trying to do with the book is is not just be a pin-up British Muslim person but also like just to be me yeah um that's quite a privilege to just be yourself and then like you know uh what is that like yeah, and, you know, of course I've got to ask, because, you know, it, it is called Sex Bomb. So, like, what was it like to see sex but not experience it for yourself? That must have been so weird. Yeah, um, this is a, that's a beautiful question. So um, props to you on that one. That's really, really thoughtful. Um, you know what? I think I think I was a bit of an idealistic person <laughs> where I was like, it's going to happen. I was a bit of an overweight um you know youngster if you like and I feel you I feel you (laughs) I had those um pains as well so it was kind of like it's not my time right now but it's gonna come and then and then kind of like 
being really grateful if I did get any attention, which is so pathetic. But it's like, you know, the fat girl vibes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can relate to this totally. <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know. I think literally like you, I'm sure I was a bit of a workaholic or studyaholic. Mm. And I did put my head in the books and like st- and, and do what I needed to do. I was working and, you know, it was something I wanted. Um, but... I guess I didn't understand it, like in terms of it, it good sex being um, encapsulated within a loving relationship and to be more than the physical act. So I think, I guess I romanticized the notion of sex uh, incorrectly. Um, and then and, and kind of maybe I, maybe the difficulty in getting any made me um, kind of like just accept that maybe I, sh- maybe I should just, Sorry, excuse me of my throat. <coughs> my throat is <coughs> it's just a frog. Let me just get water. Sorry. <coughs> do what you need to do, for sure. My throat is like, what? This always happened on a phone call. I hate it. <laughs> it's because you're so talking not- for like a prolonged time, isn't it? And sometimes we just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, let me see if my voice is back. <clears throat> I think it's back. So... I think God's trying to say, be careful what you say here, Sadia. Um, No, what I'm saying is that I think it made me overcompensate. And um, sorry, my throat is like shit. Like one minute, one minute. Yeah, basically, it made me put sex up on a pedestal Mm -hmm. instead of myself. And so I think think it's a difficult one. I, I don't think that you should just like be in a rush to give your cherry away. But equally, if you are going to do it, um you should have standards and I think I think I kind of maybe compromise on those uh to an extent um and I and I shouldn't have but also you know you live and you learn right yeah totally totally um you know and it's difficult because you know we've all kind of especially within the Asian community have experienced like versions of that because it is like this thing that people are running towards um you know Mm. because you don't experience it for yourself um so you see it around you wherever you go. It's in all the movies that you grow up with, you know, we're just like American <laughs> Pie and things like that. And, you know, and you're just like, okay, I'm not experiencing this for myself. So what is this thing, you know? And it's, yeah, it, I'm not sure if there are like fireworks when, when it actually comes to it. That's the funny thing because <laughs> we, we don't even know what to expect that, by that point. Um, and, you know, you touched on some really hard stuff in your book as well. And it's just, it's so almost like so tragic as well, because I was just, it's so horrifying. Like, you know, when you spoke about your your beloved mum, it really just, it just so heartbreaking. And and it's a real problem. It's like right across the, the community, which is how do we bring mental health to the, the foreground for South Asian people? Because this isn't, the first mother who's had to deal with this kind of terrible, terrible trauma. Um, and it is there's so much intergenerational trauma as a result because um, it gets passed down to us. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that, you know, the funny thing is, is that if you, a lot of us, I guess, have similarly to me, you grow up in a household where there's a member of the family that suffers from mental health. Um, or ill mental health and so you take for granted that you understand um, and there is no course and I think that if you haven't experienced that illness yourself then you know it kind of limits the way in which you can a understand it and b help the person who needs the help Um, it doesn't help that mental illness is like an invisible illness so it's not easily detectable by the eye. Uh, somebody could look normal and then not be feeling normal. And then, um, you know, sometimes there's skepticism about it. It's like, oh, you're just, are you just having a period problem? Or are you just like, why are you? Why have you got a mood on? You could just try harder. But like, literally, you can't see the struggle that somebody is going through, um, especially if it's like, let's say bipolar, where one day they are actually maybe functioning um easier than another day Mm -hmm. so I think I think that's really really hard for people who who do suffer from mental health problems um but also uh there's like this faux um narrative or or wokeness if you like that comes along here and there where so many people then claim the mental health chat Mm -hmm. and it's like 
Jesus. Like it's, you know, there were real people struggling with this. Um, and yeah, it's good to have a conversation, but it's not like a fashion no, thing where no. it's going to go in and out of fashion. Like it's, it can be really dark and it can be really draining and exhausting for people who, who um, go through it. So I think that we, I mean, I've personally in the community, I think that there has been a little bit of a shift from, uh, you know, uh, where where it was before perhaps where people were like it's because of a punishment for instance yeah. I think we're, we're beyond the point of because we're all kind of like not perfect yeah. anyway um but I, I I've listened to so many lectures and um I think spirituality really really is a is, is a helpful factor um obviously within that person's capacity but like having faith and hope uh that you can get through it um and being patient but also um looking after yourself and knowing that you know um your your strength levels can be different on every day so like one day just leaving the house can be a big achievement and so not being too hard on yourself um but yeah i mean honestly mental health obviously affects the most of us at some point in our life whether it's through having a baby or um grief or um not looking after yourself overdoing it um financial problems whatever it is so i just yeah that be kind um is a really good kind of mantra isn't it because i think really i believe that you know you receive what you put out mm. and so just to be kind and yeah i don't know i think it's um I think it's a tough illness for sure, and I think um, you just have to be really patient um, to get through to to get through it. And you, you, I think the problem is is that sometimes there's guilt attached um, uh, with both the person experiencing the illness, mm -hmm. which is 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 really sad, but also the carers um, maybe they have an ex element of guilt as well because they want to be there for somebody, but they want to do they have to do their life as well, Absolutely. so they can't be there. All time and so I think just being kind to yourself in terms of like and realistic about what you can do um and and just like sometimes accepting that it is gonna be a bad day mm. and then the next day will be better that's that's really you know you you can't do anything like you know it is sometimes it's just you are gonna have a bad day but then it will never be you know you will get through it knowing that you get through it and that no pain is like is is constant like that it will get easier and better yeah no completely it's it was the same in our household as well we had a um, lot of mental health issue issues uh, bipolar and bpd as well um mm -hmm. so it was very challenging so definitely could relate to what you were saying in the what's the second one you said bpd yeah borderline personality disorder okay, um, okay. so yeah it was a very very challenging um, so yeah, I, I could totally relate to what you were saying um, with the the, the bipolar, um, and it just just it's just up and down, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And you just have, as you say, take it one day as it comes, and try not to try. You know that whole oxygen mask analogy where you're just like on a plane, you put the oxygen mask on yourself first uh, because you can't help anyone else otherwise. And also, the thing is that. I liked I touched on in the book that I, I would really like to say here is that I think the problem again is there's so much stigmatization when it comes to South Asian communities and that uh one thing that we didn't hear about um is that recovery is possible and so just because somebody's maybe mental health is impaired uh for a period of time it doesn't mean that that's um permanent mm. it doesn't mean that it can't be fixed and repaired but that that narrative of hope that things can get better is so important and I think if it's it's so in the positive mindset like um and I don't mean the toxic positivity yeah. <laughs> thing but like literally if you give yourself space and and and, and accept that you know you may be um it's going to take a little bit of time and that it it may not uh you know, you accept that you can't be your strongest all the time, uh, work with what you have and um, make make goals for yourself. If, if that goal is to go out, if that goal is to have a conversation, whatever it is, small things add up um, and you will get through the finish line. Like but I, I genuinely think that a lot of people can get through it. And um, also 
being quite honest with you, diet has a lot to do with it and exercise as well. And that's so important for us to reflect on in our community as yeah. well, that sometimes spicy food is not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and also movement, like um, don't let anyone tell you that you shouldn't be uh, making yourself fit. Um, is it for a man? Why are you trying to be fit for or buff for? Like that's for you, your body, your mind, uh, mental health, everything. So making time for you, basically, like we do as South Asian women, particularly, we do so much for everybody no. else. Uh, very, very admirable. I don't, by the way, but like <laughs> of us. Um, so, you know, it's not wrong. Um, it may be it may feel alien at first to do stuff for yourself, but like it's a good habit to get into because just what you said about the oxygen mask is like, it will help you to be stronger for, for everybody else. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just good to look after yourself, whatever that looks like. If it's a face mask on a Sunday or if it's like a little jog, whatever it is, it's like just switching off because we are always so zoned on with these phones as well. Yeah. So. Definitely. Oh God. I might, I've got a, a, a penultimate question before I head to the, the last one, but it's a, first of all, I'm like, it must have been really difficult to have, like, constantly compartmentalise your life, isn't it? And I was just wondering, like, how difficult was it to keep parts of your life secret? Okay, um, I didn't talk to my family about stand-up. Um, I think, I think it's because I wanted it to be mine. Mm. <laughs> and, um so I think I just got used to it. I think sometimes comedians were a bit like strange or like awkward, nerdy type mm -hmm. of like, we, we just, we just don't always fit in. Um, and kind of like, I think I balanced it out by having these amazing exchanges with the audiences and then like these complete strangers and like being able to make them laugh. I, I just always enjoyed doing that. It's just um, being a fool is, is quite a privilege. So <laughs> I think, you know, I definitely can't complain. Um, I think sometimes I, what I grew to learn is that a lot of it is other people's problems and not taking that on. So like when it comes to compartment like compartment type, compartmentalizing very posh word <laughs> um, when it comes to doing that it's like if someone didn't see me as sexual for example um first i'm not gonna suck their dick <laughs> but no um but then it's like using that as a turning the negative into a positive so using it in stand-up but also knowing that it's their limitations and their shortness of vision and it's got really not much to do with me and just accepting acceptance has been a key theme in this episode i, I would like to hope mm -hmm. but it's like accepting that you know they don't have to you know be on board like my, my best friend monty always says like not everyone is going to be your best friend or you know not everyone's going to like be vibing with what you are and and it's okay and, that, and that's what it is like I, I'm not really like you know mainstream you could say but I'm okay with that like you know there are mainstream voices and then there's more fringe voices mm -hmm. or whatever not and I just enjoy the fact that I can be myself and I don't feel like I have to be somebody else and so people will take bits and bobs of it what they what 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 suits them or some people will look a bit deeper but my job is to be authentic and to be um you know I don't have trouble sleeping at night because I'm like mm. lying or, you know, putting a front on or being insincere. And so things like that are really important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're allowed to keep parts of yourself private because that's your prerogative for sure. Um, yes. And, you know, it's almost like a, a safety mechanism as well and a coping mechanism. Um, so it makes total sense that, you know, if you need to do that, you need to do that. And mm. you said the really important word there, which is like acceptance. Yeah, no, totally. I'm like, from what I could see, the signs just looked like an abusive relationship where this guy was clearly gaslighting. Um, and mm. so I was just like, oh, run away. You know, I, I, when you're, <laughs> you're reading, you so run away. And um, so, yeah, I, I'm so glad that you were able to find some peace at the end of all of that horrible horrible relationship after so many years so yeah again Sadia like huge thanks for speaking with me and being so candid and so open about all these really kind of gritty and difficult subjects so thank you so much oh my pleasure I really really appreciate you having me um and everybody please like and subscribe what's the podcast called again it's called how to be wow that's beautiful sorry I'm so unprepared but it's a Saturday so don't blame me <laughs> but like 
the um, Please Support How To Be podcast. It's, it's an incredible podcast, having some really like heartfelt and meaningful conversations and hopefully helping you um, along the way. Thank you so much, Sadia. And everyone go out and buy Sex Bomb because it is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, supporting our lovely ladies here. Thank you. My social media, I'm so bad. So <laughs> you've got to do it. My social media, so Instagram is at Sadia, S-A-D-I-A, underscore Azmats, A-Z-M-A-T-S. I'm also on that handle on Twitter. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.